be able to do. And um, I'll give some people time to trickle in. So um, good afternoon or morning or evening or maybe yesterday, depending on your time zone. Um, so welcome to this talk on racial equity and anti-racism and public health data collection and implications for HIV, hosted by the New England HIV Implementation Science Network or the network. My name is Daniel Davidson. I'm a program director at CIRA. And along with my colleague, Dr. David Zelaya, organizer for these network events. And Pete, you can go to the next slide. So if it's your first time joining for a network event, we are a joint initiative of CIRA and the Providence Boston CIFAR. So CIRA or the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS at Yale University is part of the Yale School of Public Health. And we are an HIV research, research center funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health. We support innovative interdisciplinary research that combines behavioral, social, structural and biomedical approaches to improve equity and status neutral HIV care. Um, and the Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research or CIFAR is a partnership between Brown University Lifespan and Boston University Boston Medical Center devoted to the pursuit of translational research to reduce the burden of HIV infection worldwide. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Pete. Um, so the network started in 2014 with an inaugural symposium and was created with three goals to stimulate and support research and evaluation collaborations, to foster partnerships among agencies, stakeholders, and researchers, and to focus on implementation science in small urban areas with a high prevalence of HIV. And the last slide. So um, we do appreciate your uh, feedback and suggestions, and a great forum for that would be to complete the very short Zoom survey that will pop up at the conclusion of the event. Um, so now I will uh, turn it over to David to tell us what we're in store for and introduce today's presenter. And Pete, you could uh, take down our slides. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, so as uh, was mentioned, uh, the talk today um, is uh, hosted by Dr. Amy Hahn Nelson, a research faculty and director of training and technical assistance for actionable intelligence for social policy which is an initiative at the University of Pennsylvania that helps states and local government collaborate and responsibly use data to improve lives, um, which will be the focus of the webinar and, uh, and, and uh, training today. Um, so without further ado, I turn it over uh, to Dr. Nelson. All right, does that work for everybody? Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, hi, everybody. It's lovely to be here with you. Um, hold on, let me get this situated so I can see the chat. Okay, there we go. Um, all right. Well, um, it's lovely to be with you today. I want to start out just knowing where people are. Um, it's always nice to see the geographies and the, the places that we represent in doing the work. Um, so this is where I'm from, from the Queen City. Um, I'm not from the city of brotherly love. If that, I don't live in Philly, if that helps. Um, Lame of the Pine, two hours from the Smokies, three hours from the Outer Banks. Um, so in the chat, where are you from? What you got? Or maybe it's where you are. Um, could also be that, where you live, where you're from, where your people are, however you interpret. Ooh, what is America's finest city, Sarah? Now I'm curious. Educate me. <laughs> oh, I believe that. San Diego is pretty nice. Excellent. All right, so we got obviously a good, a good Northeast contingent as expected. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I work for Penn, but don't live in Philly and never have. Um, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, which will, I'll explain the relevancy of all that in a, in a few minutes. Um, so looks like I am the token Southerner on the call, which is not unusual. Um, so it's lovely to be with everyone. Um, I want to frame out a little bit of the work real quick. So um, I am here representing a larger body, a very large body of work um, that is built upon many people. And oh, are my 
slides not full screen? Yeah, we can kind of see the PowerPoint um, framework. Um, they were doing weird things, so I'm on a PDF. Is it? I think if you click the green button, it should move into the slides, little green. Like the expansion, the little green dot at the top. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Green dot, green dot. Next to the. Let me try. Close the window. Okay, let me stop sharing and I will start again. Sorry, I was trying to keep my notes up. And, um, oh, good, we do have another southerner. Um, and I, I was trying to do it in PDF because sometimes I find the view is easier that way. Let me try again. Okay. Sorry about that, y'all. And now it's. It is so interesting, just a tech note. Like, I literally have been on Zoom all day, but every system has their own parameters for how they do stuff. So it makes your interaction point differently. Um, okay, I give up. I'm going to do it a different way. <laughs> <laughs> you could draw the bounding box, like. It's yeah, hold on, I got one more option. Um okay. Let's see. Does that work? I know I've lost. Okay. How about that? Does that work? Mm -hmm. Is that better? Okay. That's All right. Better. So just a little bit about my orientation. So I am here, um, I work for AISP, which is a small, small initiative out of University of Pennsylvania. And I find it really helpful just to frame out like where our work is oriented from and how it came to be. So um, a lot of our work is based upon work that started in the 90s with our two co-founders. Um, one is a researcher on homelessness and then the other is a researcher on early childhood. And um, Sometimes people are like, I still don't understand what you do or like why, where you are in the field. So <laughs> here's my best way to orient everyone quickly. So there was an old article back in 2006 around lived in Reno, Nevada. They called it a million dollar Murray is like a you know, tagline. Um, and really the research that led to this was understanding how this one person interacted with a range of, of services, right? And then how that impacted the social services and then ultimately how that impacted his care, right? And his life. So this is the work of kind of what we do, right? The way that um, Dennis, who I work with, um, was able to figure all this out is he literally put a database together for the first time of individual row level data. Um, he was able to really understand who was coming in and out of systems and how they were interacting with larger government data sets. Um, and what this led to was this idea of housing first. This is now like a very, very common approach to homelessness and to social services that it is cheaper, um, it is a return on investment to just house someone than it is to leave them homeless. So not only is it like the moral, the ethical, like the thing that we all want to do, but it's also like the most fiscally conservative thing, right? So the way he figured, now this is standard practice, right? We all, we all know this, but back 20, 30 years ago, this was like a revolutionary idea, right? And, and how this came together was really focusing on integrated data rather than just data that had been shared. Um, and so that's where I kind of interact into the work. Um, that is where I, we are placed, we are focused on row level integration of people, which is challenging, right? Because this is the most sensitive way that you can share data, right? By having lots of different data sources about an individual, there are lots of risks involved. There are privacy risks, there are over surveillance risks, there are, um, all kinds of, of risks, right? Risk of breach. Um, so, and especially because a lot of the work we do is focus on multidisciplinary, multi-sector, um, multi-sector folks. So thinking about um, all the different systems that folks interact with, this is what AASP focuses on. And this is what I mean when I talk about something like an integrated data system, or I'm talking about data access and use. It is linking data together across a range of sources at the row level data um, individually. All right. So 
I want to name in this work, the work we do that is so important for understanding, you know, intractable social issues um, like HIV, like homelessness, these like very challenging, hairy problems, right? That, in, that have dramatic impact on people. Um, there's tension here, right? So there are significant privacy risks to the reuse and redisclosure of these data. And there are significant benefits to both individuals, communities, families, when we use these data to improve program services and policies. So everything I say here is holding that tension, right? Like this is really hard and it's really important. So we have to go forward knowing that, right? That there is inherent tension here. There's no right way to do it. It is different in every community, um, but it has to be done. Is, is kind of the way I like to frame it out. So we we study places who do this well. Um, we have a network of um, sites all across the United States that routinely integrate data, and we learn a lot from these sites. Um, and I actually come from the network. So this little tiny dot that you see on the North Carolina map, that is the integrate data system that I led in my community um, for many years prior to joining Penn. So that's my orientation is I'm very community focused, um, community based. And I, I remain quite active in my community on a lot of, of fronts around data and, and just human and social services. Um, and what our main premise is that anything to do with data and data sharing, data integration is inherently relational, much more so than it is technical. Um, the technical side of this work is, you know, the tech is there, um, but the hard part is, is the people part. So you'll hopefully hear that in my comments today. Um, and this is just another framing so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, we focus a lot on governance, on legal, cleaning data, linking data, harmonizing, standardizing. Um, we do some analysis and that's a part of our work, but but like our main focus is on the kale, right? We're like trying to do the hard stuff that is often underfunded and under focused upon. Um, uh, that's that's our, our focus in the work. All right. so. The way we frame out our work is we are singularly focused on ethical use of public sector data. So that is my orientation today. I am not, um, I'm a public policy kind of human service policy researcher. I am not a public health researcher in, you know, particularly. So I wanna make sure I am representing myself accurately for this audience um, because you all have an expertise that I do not have. But the thing that I obsess about all day, every day is ethical use of public data of civic data, whatever, whatever way you call it. Um, and in the United States, this means also centering racial equity, right? So I do want to point out that the role of whiteness here is very important. It's something I often think about um, in this singular focus of ethical use of data. Um, what does it mean as a middle-aged white woman to be focused on data equity issues and to you know, do a lot of work at this intersection of use of public data and, and equity? Um, so I just want to point out, like, it's complicated, um, and I'm, you know, walking the path as carefully as I can, learning alongside it. So I just want to be very clear um, that I am walking eyes wide open, knowing that I am an incredibly white-centered institution um, within a white-focused team. The majority of my colleagues are white, um, and as a white woman. And then this is the bigger question, like, what is the role of white people? We obviously think at ASP that we have to be focused on this work of racial justice and racial equity, and we are. There are some people who would disagree with that, and we also think that that is a very valid opinion. All right, so now in the chat, what is your view of racial equity? What is your definition? A lot of this work um, of cross-sector work is trying to understand different vantage points and like different perspectives. And so we often spend a lot of time defining terms and operationalizing ideas. So I'll do a little bit of that as we talk through today. All right. Any handy definitions? It's okay if you don't have one.
great. Okay, so in the chat, we have ensuring a fair and just society, equitable opportunity. Great. Okay. Yes. Great. So I'm going to share with you a definition that we like a lot. Um, we try as much as possible not to create something if something already exists that we align with or, um, yeah, we try not to duplicate efforts. Um, so we rely a lot on an organization called Race Forward. Um, they're also part of GARE, which is the Government Alliance for Racial Equity. They, they talk about racial equity as both a process and an outcome. And we find that to be a really helpful way to think about the work. So it is, it is a process and it is an outcome. That's probably my simplest way, simplest way to, to summarize this. Um, so all of the work that I'm presenting to you today is based on, or not all of it, but most of it is um, based on a toolkit that we published back in 2020 and have continued to kind of riff upon and um, iterate from. Um, this was a participatory action research project that was created by dozens of people over several years of work. Um, and I can drop the link into the chat in just a moment. Um, what the, the toolkit does is it centers out, um, it has a data life cycle that we follow. Um, it talks about positive and problematic practices. It talks about examples of work in action, like actual sites doing the work, and then lots of activities to get started. Um, in the past year and a half, we have been leading a learning community um, called the Equity and Practice Learning Community where we take this toolkit and we try to operationalize it and make it a real thing within sites. So um, I'm going to drop into the chat uh, the link for the toolkit in case that is helpful. And then also our equity and practice learning community. Um, we have 10 sites from across the US that we work with um, who are working to center racial equity through their data integration efforts. Um, to work on both health equity in one cohort, and then we have a focus of educational equity in our second cohort. So there's just a little timeline of the work. It's been going on. It's been going at it. We've been going at it for a while. Um, not new, but, you know, continues to be very hard. Um, we think a lot about identity and how this intersects with the work. So I'm not going to get through this with you, but just to point out that, like, all of us come at this with a different layer, layer upon layer of inter intersectional identities and experiences. Um, that involve differential positions and power. Um, and this really affects how we view data access and use. And so we're going to do a series of activities together in a few minutes. And so I really want you to think how your identity dimensions is going to layer upon your understanding and your um, consideration of these challenging topics. This is another framing that I just like to offer because I think it's really important for all of us as individuals. We are doing this work. We are doing this work as part of institutions and organizations. And then we're doing this work as like a larger society, a larger community, right? Um, and so it's important to think about these different parts that we are a part of um, and how sometimes we're working really hard at the micro and then sometimes we're working hard at other levels and that's okay. Um, but all three parts have to be working at the same time for us to make progress. All right, so here's another question for you. Um, how comfortable are you with uh, concepts related to administrative data reuse? So if I were to say like data use agreement, data use license, metadata, data dictionary, like all these <laughs> um, data management kind of legal framework terms, like is that comfy? Does that feel familiar? Um, and then the next question is, how comfortable are you with racial equity? Um, very few of us who have a lot of data training um, and research training also have a depth of expertise around racial equity. So it's a, a kind of a unusual intersection in this work, um, which makes it tricky, right? You can't be an expert on racial equity, like I would argue no one is, and you really can't be an expert on data infrastructure because it's developing too fast and it's a field that is just getting so expansive, right? Um, so here we are, we're asking across these like very nebulous, challenging fields together, right? And that's really hard. Um, and then part of that, I would argue, is um, comfort and being uncomfortable. So what you got on that? You can throw in some numbers if you like that kind of thing, or you can just, yeah, perfect. All right, we got some good numbers here. Excellent. Okay. 
Excellent. Yeah, and I think it's really important to, when in, entering into any discussion around data access and use and ethical use is to frame out like, this is tough stuff and no one is an expert, right? Um, we, none of us have this all figured out. And that is part of the work is like learning better, doing better. Great, thank you for jumping in the chat on that one. All right, um, so I'm gonna keep framing out some things and then we're, like I said, we're gonna do some activities together. So um, this is the kind of the premise of our toolkit. It's this idea that um, there's nothing race neutral around data and there's nothing race neutral around data infrastructure, right? Um, anyone can look back at the history of railroads and highways in the US and say that those infrastructure projects were race neutral. They most certainly were not, right? So this, this idea that we can either co-create data infrastructure to promote equity, to promote the public good, um, or we can disregard this context, right? We can pretend like these things are neutral. Um, so we obviously, um, thank you for, for joining me on this journey because it's gonna be a long one. All right, so, Next question for folks in the chat, or feel free to, um, we have a small enough group where feel free to unmute if you're more comfortable with that. Um, we like to orient our work around the data life cycle. Um, we feel like it, it's really helpful for thinking about issues of equity. Um, prior to the last year or two, most of the kind of think pieces and documents and kind of books around data equity mostly focused on like use of algorithms, AI, um, and then data analytics, right? Well, what we find in our work is that the biggest equity issues are very early on in the data life cycle. It's more around planning, like things aren't staffed appropriately, people aren't paid appropriately. Um, you have poor data collection, or you just say, oh, we can never get the data collection we want, so we're not even gonna worry about it. We'll focus on data cleaning. So it becomes like a garbage in, garbage out situation. Um, and data access is something that most people disregard. So we tend to focus more on that in our work because we feel like it's kind of ignored. Um, and there's a lot of people who have focused on the other pieces of it. So today we're gonna talk a lot about data access um, through, through an activity we're gonna do. Great. All right. Sarah, you have many years to come of lots of places across the data life cycle you can intervene on. Great, blank slate. All right, so, and then here's the obvious premise of the toolkit, like where do we focus? It's not just algorithms, y'all. Like we gotta focus on racial equity and equity in general at every part of the data life cycle, right? It depends how things are staffed, it depends how data collect is collected, and it depends whose questions we're asking. Um, that's all part of the planning and data collection piece. So, more to come on that. All right, so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about data access. Um, let me frame out what I mean by that. So open data, what I found when I was kind of digging around to learn more about the data, open data landscape around HIV was that a lot of the data is open. There's a lot of open data um, because it's aggregated at a specific geography. Um, there's also obviously a lot of restricted data that lives within health departments. And we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, and then there is unavailable data. Um, these are data that can't be shared um, because there's a lot of legal parameters um, in public health data overall. Um, sometimes there are data are unavailable because of technical issues. Um, has anyone ever mangled a spreadsheet? That's a, like a very simple way to think about this. Like the data no longer exists once you mangle the spreadsheet. Um, or if a server has fried, there was like an epic flood in a site that we worked with a long time ago that killed a bunch of servers, data never to be recovered again. Um, now that's better because we have a lot of things are in the cloud, there's backups, there's backup to the backup. Um, but we are missing a lot of data from just loss of data for various reasons. Um, and then there's still a lot of paper copies in public health world. Um, North Carolina, we just digitized our death records like a year ago, it's kind of wild to think about. Um, so we still, yeah, I know, right? Um, <laughs> David Tosh just got real wide. <laughs> <laughs> um, paper copies are a thing. Um, same with education. My background is education policy. We still have a lot of education records that are uh, paper only. 
All right. So we like to think about um, this concept of benefit versus risk, right? So something is obviously much more risky if it is released at the person level versus if it is aggregated to a large county or a large city or at a state level, right? So this, this, these concepts of um, risk and benefit are directly related to access. And we have federal protections that, that can also constrain this, right? Like data are allowed to be released if they are aggregated at this point. So therefore that might be, you know, high benefit, low risk and so on. Um, so we're gonna think through this a little bit um, because the challenge here is you can make anything open, right? If you aggregate it to a certain geography that's big enough, the challenge then is you've then reduced the benefit, right? So like, is it helpful to release a data point at the state level? Whereas if you released it at like, you know, a census block level, maybe you could target programs or resources, right? So the challenge here is there's this always this tension, again, tension is the, the theme to the work um, between what is high benefit and what is low risk, what is high risk and low benefit. So we're gonna think through some examples. These are the way, these are the questions we ask to think through our examples. So. This is another frame. Sorry, I'm, I'm full of frames. Um, we have to get it, you know, risk versus benefit. So is this legal? Is this ethical? Is this a good idea? And then how do we know or who decides? So that's the kind of the data governance piece is that last question. How do we know who decides? And I'm not going to read all these to you, but these are more of these slides are available. You can use them however you want. We're done. So is this legal? This is really around like authority. Like, do you have public health authority? Do you not? Are you situated within government? Are you in a university that has no right to individual level data? Um, as many of us are situated in universities. Um, so legal authority is very important and off crystal clear. So that's a challenge in this work. Um, and, and I just wanna point out, but like this topic in particular is very complex. Like I did, I did a little, was trying to figure out my own, you know, understanding of the legal and regulatory issues here. Um, and there are significant regulatory restrictions on HIV data privacy and confidentiality. So I'm not gonna go into the details here, but just to say like, this is super complex as I'm sure you all know, um, and make sure you talk to your legal counsel with any use of restricted data um, because it gets real complex real fast. Um, yeah, again. Just to reiterate, <laughs> the complexity is real here, as it should be, right? Like this should be the most sensitive data that we can release on someone, arguably. Okay, so is this ethical? Is there benefit? Does the benefit outweigh the risk is the easiest way to think about this. These are just some examples that our participatory research project mapped on here. If you were to map these, you might map them differently. This is just one example, um, but we think a lot about does the benefit outweigh the risk? Is this a good idea? Like, can you do anything with this data? Let's say you're gonna spend half a million dollars on a study researching this question that someone has, like what can you do with the results, right? So is this a, a good idea to do? Um, is the data available to answer the question? Do you have resources to follow up on, on what, you're, you know, what you're asking? Um, what can be done, right? Um, and this can be quite tricky, right? Again, that benefit versus risk. Um, so is this a good idea? And then the last one is my answer to everything. Um, my answer to most things is you need data governance around it. So how do we know and who decides? Um, and we think of data governance as like a very broad topic of it's the people, policies, procedures that support how data are used. Um, if you come from an IT background, which I don't think folks on this call do, you think about data governance a little differently. We use a very broad definition. All right, so back to our little matrix. Governance is how you know that you're in the green or you know how to get something to the green, right? So maybe you have a governance process, the governance identifies like it's really high risk, low benefit, um, or maybe you figure out it's, it's high benefit, um, but low risk. Um, so. You, it's how you know you're in the green or how to get to the green is, is one way to think about it. Okay, so now we're, we're going to examples. Feel free to come off um, to turn your camera on if that's helpful. 
Um, we're hoping for some discussion. As I said at the beginning of this, I am not an expert here. I obsess about ethical use of data and um, administrative data reuse. I do not have a background in this topic. Um, and so I am really relying on you all to, you know, to teach me. So let's do this. You ready? So think about some open data. So these are data that are publicly available. Um, so one example I found very readily available was HIV prevalence geocoded by zip code. That was one. Another one I found was HIV diagnoses by neighborhood, sex, race, and ethnicity. So what do you think in your head without knowing anything else? Can you imagine that these might be high benefit, low risk? So that's one, it's a green. Is it high risk, high benefit? High risk, low benefit, that's the red, the one we pretty much wanna avoid. And then um, low benefit, low risk. So there's not a lot of risk to it, but there's not a lot of benefit to it. So it's probably a waste of resources. So what do you think? And feel free, like in the chat, you could say A and a number, or you can unmute and say it out loud. We have some time. Okay, so we see, so we see that HIV prevalence geocoded by zip code is high benefit and low risk. So it's firmly in the green. Yes, Donna, I agree. Um, avoiding stigma is an important principle of data equity. And I also worry about um, data released in that way. Yeah, these are excellent questions. Okay, I knew these questions would come up. So I wanted to show you the actual pictures. Um, Cause I had the same questions. Like, I don't know if it's ethical or not. I don't know if you know, it's a good idea. Um, so here's my community. This is Charlotte Mecklenburg and here's our data geocoded. There's the little citation. Um, I found this really interesting. I had not seen this particular data before when I went looking for it. Um, but I do want to point out something, and this is what one of the respondents threw in the chat. Um, this is not race neutral. Like, so this is a, the same map. This is percent white. Same map, but flipped, right? So again, like, remember our premise at the very beginning, like there's nothing neutral about these, right? Nothing neutral. So in my community, nothing neutral about these data as far as race goes. Um, and I'm sure we'd find that in most communities. Um, so, and then here's the neighborhood example. Um, I do think this is, whoop, sorry, wrong button. Um, I do think this is a great example of, um, of data being um, aggregated well, but almost to a point where it might not be helpful. Um, these are names. I don't. I don't know enough to know if, if this would be. Um, yeah, that's yeah. These are all like really important privacy considerations, and I don't think there is a right answer, which is why my answer is always you need to do governance around it. I don't know the answers here. I don't think there is one. I think it just is, it involves careful discussion and conversation. Um, I would like to point out though, these are open data that I found with minimal Google search. So <laughs> um, someone has determined that these are legal and ethical and someone's determined that they should be put on a website and that takes a lot of resources. So um, someone thought they were a good idea, but I'm not sure if there's good data governance around it. Um, NYC Open Data does have data governance around their data holdings, so I can, I can feel confident about that one. All right, so let's go um, to our next example. Here's just a, a refresher. This, these are the way I think about these questions. If it's helpful, hopefully it is. Um, so let's go back to our framing again. So open data is what we just saw, restricted data unavailable data. So we are now going to move to a discussion about restricted data. And again, I am relying on you all who have this content expertise because um, I do not have it. So please jump in. Um, and Daniel and David are going to help me frame these out because they 
um, know these examples better than I do. So we're gonna start with a discussion around HIV cluster detection. Um, so, Daniel and David, do you mind framing that for us? You're gonna do a, a better job than I will. Um, I, can, I can try. There might be someone on the call who could frame it better than me, but um, so HIV cluster detection, this is a CDC priority to, um, to try to genetically link um, clusters uh, of, of new HIV infections that are detected. Um, I think the risk around this is that this is very much about identifying individuals and their connections mm -hmm. to one another. And um, that uh, although this data should be, um, you know, this isn't something that would go out, outside of the health department and the CDC that in theory, um, having some potential evidence that one person may have given HIV to another person if you're in a state where um, HIV is, you know, if there's HIV criminal, criminal criminalization, um, if you were to pass HIV from one person to another, then that could be um, very risky for that for that person mm -hmm. if it were to get into law enforcement hands. That's my understanding of the topic. Other people may know more. So the questions are here, this is incredibly restricted data, right? So there's gonna be credentialed use around this. It's gonna be um, a lot of data management practices to secure these data, um, very restricted access to the actual source data systems, right? But the data still exists and there is opportunity for misuse. But again, that tension, right, that we talked about, like this is the most sensitive data you you can hold on someone and this cluster detection benefits people and communities, right? So um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on weighing in. Do you see this as high benefit, low risk? I mean, what, what, where would you place this, one, two, three, or four? So high risk um, and high benefit. Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's without being a content expert here, that's where my, where I'd probably go to as well. And so the question is putting data governance around this, right? Is there a way you could get to the green, right? Could you put some privacy enhancing technology around this? Could you put additional data security measures around this? Um, could you put, you know, audit trails on the data system where this source, where this data lives? Um, what are the ways that you can enhance security to ensure privacy more to get it in the green is one way to think about this. And again, I don't have the right answer. I do know that health departments are chronically underfunded and often have very lagging tech. Um, so a consideration, right, in this. All right, any other thoughts or I'm gonna go to the next example. Okay, data to care. Um, and again, I'm going to rely on Daniel and David to frame this out for us, or someone else can jump in. <laughs> Any volunteers? Anybody want to be brave? <laughs> so, guys, my my understanding of data to care would be, um, I think this is mostly used around identifying individuals who are out of care um, with probably mm -hmm. differing definitions in different um, locations. Uh, and so this would be from, um, I think again, health departments would have access um, mm -hmm. to this information based on um, provider records um, based on Medicaid records. I don't know, there's probably a number of ways you could get this. Mm -hmm. I, I've not really worked on data to care, but but it's, it's as you can imagine, an, an effective way to reduce new HIV transmissions because if someone, if you know someone has HIV and they're not on medication, and then mm -hmm. they could still transmit HIV. Whereas if they, if you can get them back into care, then they're not gonna pass on HIV. So it's potentially a very cost-effective way to, um, to reduce new, new onward transmission. 
Great. So thank you for that. So again, thinking about this risk versus benefit, right? Um, where would you place this on the matrix? Okay, so it looks like we have another two. So high risk, high benefit, right? Um, so you're, you're seeing the theme with these data, which is interesting because um, in a lot of data equity discussions, there's a lot more variance around um, where you would place uses. But I think here it's, I think a lot of things are gonna be in two. It is incredibly high risk and incredibly high benefit. So we have to, we have to oh, I love it when people do a half. Good job, Anthony. Um, <laughs> break the model, do it. Um, okay, we've got, I think, a couple more examples. And again, feel free to jump in. This is, um, okay, depending on how, how, how the care data is released. Yeah, I mean, there we've made a lot of advancements on case management systems now. We now have audit trails, and we have a lot of, uh, you know, ways to track who is accessing, who is accessing what data when, that we didn't have even even five years ago, and these are a lot more cost effective. Um, these aren't, you know, like really expensive data systems. This is standard stuff now. So, yeah, I think the tech is there for this to be more of a one, depending on the system setup and the staffing. All right, next question um, or next example to think through: um, looking at HIV in correctional facilities. What are some nuances here and considerations around benefit versus risk? And y'all, I was a middle school teacher. I can be quiet for a long time, so just jump in. Yeah, stigma, I feel like is a, a huge, huge issue here. Mm -hmm. Consent. Yeah, it is interesting. This is the first time we're bringing up consent here. Um, I have complicated thoughts about consent that we actually just published, and I'll drop that into the chat. Um, there are a lot of challenges with consent in a public health context, as I'm sure we all know, and uh, more and more there's a, a movement to saying, like, the only ethical use of data is data that has informed consent around it. But in a public health context, I would disagree that's not the case. Um, so yeah, Donna, I agree with you. What, what are they consenting to, right? Um, and also if you put consent around it, you're going to be missing, so you introduce a lot of bias into your understanding of the problem, um, which creates a lot of issues and prevents um, being able to really respond effectively with programs and, and services, yeah. Yeah, and Michael, I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone know the answer to that? Is there any disclosure obligation requirement? I'm assuming that is state level. I don't believe that's a federal. Reg. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's probably a lot of variance, right? Um, just as there in as there is with the criminalization piece. Okay, so again, we have a very complicated example, um, but I think folks are general in agreement that this would be a two again or a one. So a lot of risk, but potentially a lot of benefit.
All right, I think we have one more example. So this is another, another one that um, is an issue with HIV, but it's an issue in a lot of public health concerns. Um, in this context, we wanted to bring up the challenge of erasure, which can happen if we aggregate. So there's, again, that tension, right, between thinking through privacy and redisclosure um, risks, right, but also if we aggregate too much or if we um, do not disclose small cell sizes, we are erasing populations. Um, and this is very common um, in the public health space, like a, a really good example during the COVID, you know, for those of you who looked at COVID data, there were often entire blank spots um, on maps where you have large lands that are um, reservation lands. Um, because, and not because there wasn't COVID there, but because the data wasn't disclosed or shared for lots of reasons. And um, there became complete erasure for certain populations. So I think this is something that's more and more in our, kind of our lexicon and our understanding of, of how data equity can, can impact um, different populations. And I think it's um, particularly present here. So what are your thoughts? High risk? A benefit again we have a two yeah yep okay so really high risk and really high benefit once again so i think that's the summary of this topic <laughs> um which makes it and which makes me just want to like say data governance, data governance, data governance over and over and over, right? It's got to have people talking about how to protect the people and how to protect, um, you know, privacy risk, but also the health and um, well-being of folks. All right, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, what is one phrase from today? that you will keep with you. Think, think of it as like a sticky thought, sticky idea, something you wanna come back to. I myself will be bugging some lawyer friends around me, uh, mandatory disclosure. That's interesting to me. <laughs> David's just trying to get brownie points. <laughs> Right. All right, y'all. Well, that's that's all I have today. I'm happy to like talk through anything, lift up another idea. Um, we'll share out these slides with you. Um, everything we do is open, and we we encourage use of our tools that we create to be shared with other people. So please use anything that I use today. Um, we just ask for attribution, but um, we have a lot of tools that we roll out, and hope that. Um, that they're helpful as you're talking through these really challenging issues in your in your field. Oh, hi, Dean Bachman. Thank you. Really great, Amy. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining. All right, y'all. Any other questions? Or I'm happy to. We did have some questions come in through the Zoom. Um, Daniel, do you want me to kind of lift those up as well? Oh, it looks like somebody has a question as well. Yeah. Debs, do you want to jump in? And then we've got a, a couple of questions that came into the chat um, or through the Zoom registration that I can talk through. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks for um, giving me the opportunity to ask the question, and it was a very engaging uh, talk, so thank you. Um, I was wondering whether your, your examples that we went through in that matrix format are they based upon um, racial data as well or in general for all population? Because the answers will be quite different. It might move from one box to another. So given the topic, I was wondering whether, just probing you a little bit more on this. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is that these were just meant to get people thinking about the questions, so legal, ethical, good idea, how do you know who decides? Um, it, they were just examples. Um, and also to lift up the point that like, there's not usually a clear yes or no to any of this. It involves discussion and discernment with people who are knowledgeable um, around the topic. So we didn't come at it with any 
particular lens or, you know, outcome. And I don't know enough about, I, I honestly, this isn't my content area of expertise, so I don't even know enough to place these well. I could do this in other topics that I know a lot about, but I'm relying on you all with the content expertise. Think of it more as like a process piece. Thank you. Well, maybe part of the point is that HIV is is racialized in the U.S., right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're looking, um, you, you know, any of those topics that you're talking about, they're going to you know impact people who are most mm -hmm. impacted by HIV in the U.S. Yeah, and we would argue everything's racialized. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great point and great question. Any other questions? One, one of the things yeah. that um, I just want to um, contribute to this conversation, I really appreciate your presentation, Amy, is that the world of um, HIV AIDS has some incredible databases that I think can be put to even greater use. Mm -hmm. And so, and the, the points that you're raising about data governance, I think are, are really important points for this community to consider mm -hmm. in terms of maximizing the utility of the data. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm guessing that you would be available to consult to help advise people. For those of us who've been working in this field for a long time, the issues of stigma mm -hmm. and um, privacy are, have, have been um, important um, considerations in terms of guiding our use of the data. But to, so you, you're, you know, for example, you're, um, your piece on informed consent brings us to a new place in terms of new thinking about how to maximize the utility of the data. So I appreciate the messages that you um, that you shared. Thank you. Yeah, and I think again, this like the one word answer was really helpful for folks to respond because I do think with this particular topic, um, with this data source, it is the tension, right? The there are a few places where there are bigger risks for a redisclosure. Um, but here, the, the stigma and the, and not only stigma, but action, right? Stigma is um, what happens because of that stigma. These, these repercussions are significant and real. So, yeah. Um, so we had a couple questions that came in through the chat, and I wanted just to mention them. Um, one, someone asked about our position on compensating participants for um, in a study. So I would say from like an equity standpoint, yes, like people should be compensated, um, but it gets really challenging very quickly. So just want to, again, there's tension um, in that piece. So we have a guidance we're actually working on. It will roll out through our newsletter if anyone's interested in that on like how to pay people. Um, and that sounds very simple, but if you've ever tried to do it, it gets very complicated. Like Historically, a lot of folks have used gift cards, but then they found that a lot of the gift cards are never used. Um, there are real concerns around um, thresholds, income thresholds and um, cliffs. Um, so, you know, you, an individual participates in a participatory action research study, gets paid as a community researcher, and then they lose their uh, childcare subsidy. Like that's a, a real story from um, a site that we've worked with recently. So. Um, but you know, yes, we should compensate, but again, we have to do it really, really carefully with a lot of governance, a lot of people thinking about intended and unintended consequences and how to do it um, in a way that is uh, respectful, but also um, acknowledging the complex lives we all live, right? Yeah, Donna, jump in. Donna, are you able to unmute? Feel free to, or you're, you can also um, throw it into the chat if that's easier for you. Oh, maybe. All right. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, my, my microphone had an issue earlier. Um, all right, Donnie, feel free to drop, drop that in the chat and I can read it aloud. Anyone else? I can probably have time for like one or two more. There was also a, a question that came in. Um, yes, Donna, I agree. Coercion is a challenge. Um, and um, that, that it's a great example of governance. Um, I agree there are concerns there. That's the same concern I have with informed consent. A lot of times when you put informed consent around things that can be seen as coercion, um, there are a lot of the same complaints there um, and concerns. So yes, um, any kind of made vulnerable population, marginalized population, um, however you want to describe that vulnerable, there's lots of terms. Um, but we mean people that have less power than other people, right? And so what does that mean and how does that show up? Um, and these are all really important things to weigh, um, but I do think the default should be payment um, is my general uh, perspective, but it is hard and has to be done very carefully. Yeah. All right. I think there was a, a comment that came in through the Zoom that pretty much just, I don't remember the exact wording of it, but pretty much said like anti-racism seems a little, as my grandmother would say, like big for your britches. Um, like it's a little much for what we're talking about, right? Like to be real here, this is all very incremental work. Like we're, we're not at anti-racism yet. We are, we are working like at the lower thresholds of like equality and equity. Um, and we are not at a place of like full power sharing and full, we are not at justice. Um, and so you will rarely see in our work, we rarely write about justice because we're not there yet. Um, very little of this, if we could just get to equality in some spaces, it would be a big step forward and then ultimately to equity. So I want to acknowledge that, that we're using big words here that are visionary and aspirational, um, and, but we have a lot of work to do to get there. Yeah, sorry to be a bright ray of sunshine on this topic, but <laughs> just trying to be real. <laughs> There's a lot of work to do. All right, thanks, thanks, Amy. So we're at time, and we will send out. I mean, you put some links in the chat, but we'll send them out again by email to the people registered and yeah. on the slides. So thanks everyone for joining. And yeah. you, when you close out, you should see a, a quick little um, survey. So please just take a minute and do that if you have time. Thank you. Great. Thanks, y'all.